I'm next on the broadcast. The National Assembly moves another step closer to passing a landmark anti-corruption bill which would subject public officials to criminal charges if caught taking cash or valuables worth over approximately $900. The massive manhunt continues for the two remaining suspects of the deadly terrorist shooting attack in Paris. Authorities close in but have to negotiate a hostage situation near France's main airport. The risk index for global financial markets jumps, soaring to levels seen during the 2008 financial crisis on fears of Greece's exit from the eurozone and lower global oil prices. Primetime News begins now. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News live from Seoul. I am Kang Teddy. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We begin with the latest developments on the massive manhunt in the wake of the deadly attack on the offices of a French magazine two days ago. Paris attackers are surrounded by police in an industrial complex near the Charles de Gaulle Airport in northeast Paris. They are currently in communication or negotiation with the police, saying who are saying that they are willing to die as martyrs. Uh, what they also told the police was that uh, they are al-Qaeda in Yemen. One female hostage is being held by gunmen, but no violence is being reported. The area near the airport is under lockdown uh, with the medical team and the SWAT team deployed at the spot in case of emergency situations. It's reported that police will not take action, saying that uh, it will be a waiting game between uh, the attackers. Meanwhile, CNN is uh, reporting that the police killed in a Thursday where a police woman was gunned down in a suburb in Paris is linked to the terror attacks on the Charlie Hebdo magazine. We're also getting updates from AFP of a random shooting that happened in a grocery store in Paris as well. It's not uh, confirmed whether the shooting has been um, has been uh, is linked to the Paris attack, but the suspect is believed to be dressed very similarly to the suspects. Do note that this is a very fluid situation as there are a lot of uh, developments over the past couple of hours. Now a tribute paid with the pen. Now, that's what the cartoonists from all over the world are doing following the massacre at the office of Charlie Hebdo on Wednesday. They've come together to demonstrate that freedom of speech will prevail and that such attacks will never uh, keep them from breaking out their pens. Our Lee ji has more. A picture is worth a thousand words. French leading broadsheet Le Monde posted an image that says wholeheartedly with Charlie Hebdo and promised to do all it can to keep the tragedy stricken magazine up and running. Australian cartoonist David Pope's image went viral on social media. His image shows a gunman standing over to a dead cartoonist and justifying his action by saying he drew first. Pope says nothing justifies the brutal and shocking massacre. Many of the cartoons spoke on behalf of the victims and stood up for free speech. The Telegraph's cartoonist Christian Adams was one of them. His published product shows no illustration and is titled Extremist Approved Cartoon. This one is by an American political cartoonist Rob Torno. It shows sharpened pencils and pens being pointed against their attacker. Torno wrote a commentary on the massacre saying the cartoonists at Charlie Hebdo gave their lives to advance freedom of expression. French London-based illustrator Lucille Clark's image shows the solidarity of her colleagues. This image was liked over 82,000 times on Instagram. Posting the image, Clark writes, break one, thousand will rise. Just like that, cartoonists from all over the world mourn the deaths of their fallen colleagues, but promised not to back down in the face of violence. Lee Jun, Arirang News. Korea has taken another step to becoming a more transparent society when it comes to potential corruption among public officials. One day after an anti-corruption bill passed a subcommittee at the National Assembly, the ruling party expressed its support. Our Park Ji-won reports. 
The Senori Party's floor leader Lee Wan Gu vowed Friday that the ruling Conservative Party will do its best to create a more clean and transparent society. The ruling party vowed to expand the scope of a special inspection bill aimed at preventing corruption among presidential officials to include other high-ranking officials like ministers and heads of key government organizations. Their push comes a day after a subcommittee of the National Assembly passed a comprehensive anti-corruption bill in a first step towards becoming law. Named after the former head of the Anti-Corruption and Civil Rights Commission, the so-called Kim Young-nan law was first introduced 17 months ago. One of its most noticeable provisions is that public officials will face criminal charges when caught taking money or valuables worth more than 1 million Korean won or some 900 U.S. dollars. The bill extends to public officials and their families, ranging from government officials and those at state-funded agencies, and even to private school teachers and media workers. It is estimated that some 18 million people will fall under the bill's purview. Floor leader of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy, Woo yun gun also welcomed the bill, saying it will help lay the groundwork for a transparent society. The bill could pass the Assembly's plenary session as early as Monday, and once passed, the law could be implemented by January next year. As of last year, Korea ranked 43rd in Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index out of some 175 countries. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. The presidential chief of staff has apologized over the recent document leak at the nation's top office. Speaking before the National Assembly, Chief of Staff Kim Gi-chun said he feels responsible for the leak and would step down from his post once his duties related to the probe are complete. The document scandal centers around allegations that President Park Geun-hye's former aide had been meddling in state affairs to drive out the chief of staff. Meanwhile, Senior Secretary for Civil Affairs Kim Young-han, who suspected of intervening in the probe, has reportedly decided to resign after refusing to show up at a National Assembly session on Friday. North Korea has refused to accept a uh, resolution drafted by South Korean lawmakers last month that uh, calls for a swift resumption of inter-Korean dialogue. South Korea's Unification Ministry said on Friday that it tried to deliver the resolution this morning, but North Korea rejected it, citing orders from above. The resolution urges Pyongyang to reduce the military tensions and to return to the negotiating table for unconditional talks on humanitarian aid for North Korean residents. The ministry called North Korea's rejection regrettable as it comes amid Pyongyang's calls for expanded talks and negotiations. There is fresh evidence that North Korea is able to or very close to having submarines capable of firing ballistic missiles. Because submarines can stealthily glide underwater, such upgrades would pose a significant security threat to South Korea, Japan, as well as the United States. Kwon Soa reports. Satellite pictures posted on 38 North show North Korea is upgrading a submarine to make it capable of firing missiles. The U.S.-based website devoted to analysis of North Korea says a rectangular opening around 4 meters long and 2 meters wide can be seen on the submarine which sat in the North Simpo South shipyard at the time the photos were taken. Satellite imagery analyst Joseph Bermudez says the hole probably contains launch tubes that could fire up to two missiles. Once the process is complete, the ship may then be tested for land attack missile technology. If the analysis turns out to be correct, then North Korea's submarine development has taken a significant stride forward, posing a bigger threat to South Korea, Japan and U.S. bases in the region, given that submarines are much harder to detect than other pieces of military hardware. It would also mean a whole new level of missile defense planning for nations at risk. However, experts believe North Korea still lacks technological experience and constructing missile-capable ships would be expensive and very time-consuming. Although there appears to be no immediate threat, 
Satellite imagery also showed workers moving around the shipyard's facility over the past six months. This raises concerns. Pyongyang is actively working on a possible naval construction program. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Where is North Korea headed with its nuclear program, and what should the U.S. do about it? For an expert's viewpoint, our Hwang Sung-hee spoke with Joe Witt, a senior fellow at the U.S. Korea Institute at ASAIS, who currently runs the 38 North website and served as an official at the State Department for 15 years. Have a look. So in his New Year speech, Kim Jong-un expressed his desire to mend ties with South Korea. He even suggested an inter-Korean summit. But at the same time, he made clear he has no plans to end Pyongyang's nuclear program and demanded an end to joint South Korea-U.S. military exercises. So how do you assess his speech? Well, I think it, it would be right to be very cautious in our assessment of what he said. Um, he did offer that olive branch. but. There are a lot of uh, conditions that are attached. And the bigger issue here is that there's not going to be any resolution to the nuclear problem without an active American involvement in, the, in solving this whole problem. And right now, the U.S. administration really isn't involved at all. In less than two months, South Korea and the U.S. will be conducting their joint military drills. If the Koreas don't make any progress by then, do you expect to see North Korea launch another provocation? Uh, once again, you're asking me to make a prediction. And so what I would say is that at the moment, there is no sign, at least, of preparations for a long-range missile test mm -hmm. or even a nuclear test. Whether they would launch other types of provocations, I really don't know, but I would point out that experts repeatedly predict provocations mm -hmm. and are wrong most of the time. So given North Korea's steady progress in building up its nuclear capabilities, what steps should the United States and its allies take this year to cope with Pyongyang's nuclear threats? Well, I think it's very clear, at least to me, that uh, American policy is in disarray and our coordination with South Korea in order to have the maximum effect on the North is not very good. So the first step here is that in Washington, we need to conduct a full-scale review of American policy towards North Korea. The chances of success may be not so great, but nevertheless, the way we're approaching this problem now is, has clearly failed. I'm talking about a full-scale review that looks at not only the diplomatic track and what might and might not be possible there, but also a, a more reasonable, measured, and effective approach on sanctions and also looking at the trends over the next five years in North Korea's WMD programs and making sh sure that we take the security steps necessary to protect ourselves. Do you foresee a shift in Washington's policy towards Pyongyang in the coming months? Uh, I'm very skeptical. I, I think the administration has other approach, other issues that it's uh, focused on. And also, I think the administration has basically given up on trying to deal with North Korea, aside from occasionally slapping sanctions on Pyongyang. So uh, I'm very skeptical about that. Nevertheless, uh, one way of perhaps encouraging Washington to shift would be for South Korea to take a greater role in pushing the Obama administration to become more active. I know a number of us were hoping for that when President Park was elected, but that hasn't happened so far. And without an active American involvement in dealing with North Korea, I'm very skeptical South Korea can get very far, particularly on the issues that at least we care about, which is the security threat posed by North Korea. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News.
Tumbling oil prices and fears of Greece's possible exit from the eurozone could spell trouble for global financial markets. An index that measures risk aversion in markets around the world has soared to levels not seen since the 2008 global financial crisis and the U.S. credit rating downgrade in 2011. Our Kim Min Ji has more on what's creating these new anxieties. The world's financial markets are on edge, with risk soaring to levels seen during the global financial crisis of 2008. The City Macro Risk Index, which measures risk aversion in global financial markets, rose to 0 0.96 this week in a scale of 0 to 1. The index, indicating riskier market conditions when approaching 1, tracks various financial data, including stock market volatility and bond rates in the U.S. and other emerging economies. The high rating stems from the dip in crude prices that began in mid-2014 and fears that it could spell financial trouble for emerging markets. Greece's possible exit from the eurozone is another factor. It is rare that the index soars to above the 0.9 mark. The current level matches previous records seen during the 2008 financial crisis and after the 2011 downgrade of U.S. credit rating. But with oil prices moving narrowly in the past two days and the U.S. job situation showing signs of improving, stock markets in Asia and the U.S. have regained some of their recent losses. Markets were also supported by speculations that the European Central Bank will institute stimulus measures. But many financial analysts expect global markets to remain unstable for the foreseeable future, given the uncertain fate of Greece and a prolonged recession in the Eurozone, coupled with depressed global crude prices. Kim min Arirang News. LG Electronics showed off its new premium smartphone in this year's Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, the G Flex 2. It was chosen for the Editor's Choice Award by CES official partner Review.com. Android Central, Express Reviews, Laptop Magazine, and others voted the G Flex 2 as a CES top pick or staff pick. Equipped with a 5.5-inch full HD screen, the G Flex 2 is smaller than its predecessor. It also comes with a curved plastic OLED display and the latest Qualcomm 810 processor. For more than 20 years now, a city in the mountains of Gangwon-do province has hosted a snow festival, but this year's version is a bit different from the past ones. Our Shin Semin tells us why. There is a 100% chance of snow for the mountainous area of Taegwalyang. Tourists from all over have converged on the town, one of the biggest snow festivals Korea has to offer. Located in the northeastern province of Gangwon-do, the festival features intricate sculptures carved out of ice and snow, drawing visitors and turning the frigid temperatures into an energetic adventure. Gliding down a frosty slide, speeding on an ice sled pulled by parents, and riding a tube through the winter wonderland, these are just a few of the attractions. The weather forecast aside, the snow is a huge draw for many, even those who are from countries known for their harsh winters. We have six months of snow, <laughs> so, so it's a little different. Our, um, our view to the snow is a little different, but yes, we like, we like these festivals. Posing for pictures and climbing up their favorite icy characters and even visiting a frozen home, the bitter winds on their cheeks don't seem to matter much. We didn't get much snow in our hometown this year, but having my children out to see the igloos they read about in books and giving them a sense of where the next Olympics will be held is educational. Looking ahead to the 2018 Winter Olympic Games in Pyeongchang, there are more winter activities to offer this year. But this fluffy snow and fun won't last for long, so better make plans to come out sooner rather than later. <laughs> Shin Se-min, Arirang News, Pyeongchang. Officials in Indonesia have detected signals believed to be from the black box of the AirAsia jet liner that crashed in the Java Sea. 
With more, we turn to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, this jetliner filled with passengers and crew went down nearly two weeks ago. What's the current situation on the recovery operation? Well, a team of elite divers has begun the operation to raise the tail section of the AirAsia plane on this Friday. Loading balloons are being used to help raise the wreckage, which is currently buried in mud 30 meters underwater. Despite the challenges, Indonesia's chief of national search and rescue said all efforts were being made to secure the hull. There are ongoing efforts to lift the tail up. At this moment, divers are tying the tail with straps and then we will try to lift it using two methods, the floating balloon combined with cranes. This is so that the tail sector won't be damaged because we assume that the black box is located in the tail sector. Faint underwater pings were detected in the main search area. However, officials have not been able to confirm if the sounds came from the voice and flight data recorders. So far, small pieces of debris and 48 bodies have been recovered, mostly from the water surface. And turning to Thailand, the nation's parliament has begun an impeachment hearing against former Prime Minister Yingluck Shinawat. The embattled ex-leader is facing charges related to abuse of power, which led her to being removed from power office, that is, last May. In her opening statement on Friday, Yingluck denied all the allegations made against her. I've been impeached three times. The first time was a result of the dissolution of the House of Representatives. The second time was by the verdict of the Constitutional Tribune. All of the impeachment actions have been done. I don't see any reasons left on which to be impeached further. Thailand's first female prime minister has maintained her innocence in a national rice subsidy scandal that cost the country billions of U.S. dollars in losses. And finally, if you're traveling to Japan anytime soon, you may want to hold off from eating that next Big Mac. McDonald's restaurants there have been facing a series of food safety scandals this past year. A strip of vinyl was found in a chicken McNugget over the weekend, and back in August, a human tooth was discovered in some French fries. The company's top brass in Japan appeared before the public on Wednesday to apologize for the incidents. McDonald's has been dealing with a host of other problems, such as potato shortages and declining sales. It's all causing investors, as well as consumers, to lose faith in the golden arches. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here next week. Hello and welcome. I'm Stephen Che with a look at sports. Now the 2015 Asian Cup is finally underway. Host Australia and Kuwait met in the cup opener in Melbourne and the atmosphere was electric from the first whistle. Now early in the first half, it was Kuwait with the first goal on a corner kick header by Ali Hussein Fadel. But Australia came alive leveling on Tim Cahill's right-footed strike and that was before going ahead on a Luongo header. Now we go to the second half. Mile Yedinak's penalty put the Socceroos ahead by two before Troisi slotted past the keeper in stoppage time for the icing on the cake. And with that, Australia set the tone in the thriller. They face Oman on Tuesday. Meanwhile, in the other Group A meeting on Saturday, South Korea and Oman will clash. Now, the Taeguk Warriors are expected to come out ahead. Now, the key for South Korea will be to keep the pressure on the Oman defense, who are missing defender Saad Al Mukaini to injury. So Dong Min looks to carry the load up top, but Ki Sung Young will be the one connecting the dots in the midfield. Meanwhile, Oman, according to their coach Paul Leguang, need to create a surprise in a big way to beat the favorites. The kickoff is at 2 p.m. Korea time. And from the pitch to the pitching wedge, the PGA Tour is set to tee off in the new year with the Hyundai Tournament of Champions in Hawaii. Last year's champion, Zach Johnson, tops the field, which is limited to the PGA Tour winners of the previous season, hence the name. South Korea's Pae Sang Moon and No Sung Yeol also joined the fray for a chance at the 5.7 million US dollar purse. 
And speaking of pay, he'll hope to shed the distractions surrounding his military conscription obligations. And finally, we've hit the midpoint of the KBL season, which means it's time for the All-Star Weekend. This year, fans are in for a treat. Kicking off the two-day festivities on Saturday, the Korea All-Stars face the KBL All-Stars, which is essentially the Asian Games gold medal winners taking on the KBL's finest. Then on Sunday, the main event, the three-point shootout and dunk contest takes place before the main event, the KBL's Senior Magic versus the Junior Dream. Both games start at 2 p.m. sharp at Chamshil Arena in Seoul. And that wraps it up for sports this week. Your weather's up next. Have a good night. Hello, I'm Kim Bo Gyal with the weather forecast. The cold snap has finally eased and temperatures will remain above the seasonal averages over the weekend, but there is a chance of flurries for the central regions on early Sunday morning. At the moment, the nation is under clear skies due to a high pressure front from China, and although most regions will get to enjoy moderate winter weather, cold waves will stick around in some areas. Also, dry weather advisories which have been issued along the eastern coast for the past three weeks may extend to other places. On Saturday, the fine dust index may rise to higher than normal levels in the capital areas. Moving on to Saturday's readings, Seoul makes it to 4, Daegu and Gwangju 8, Busan hits 9. On to other regions, Jeju peaks at 10, Dokdo hits 6, Mount Kumgang minus 5. Hope you have a lovely Friday evening and more updates coming up after midnight. Thanks very much, uh, Bo Gyeong, and that's primetime news for this Friday. Thanks for watching. I'm Kang Tae. And I'm Sean Lim. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon.